So we're starting with section 10.1. It's called the goodness of fit test. It's always good rather than start talking about abstract uh, stuff. Just give you an example of what you can do with a goodness of fit test. If you were on campus, guys, this is what I would have asked you uh, to do. Probably I should have asked you to do, but I didn't want anyone to go outside and uh, to the gas station, you know, to buy uh, what I usually ask students to do. So this is what I usually ask students to do. I ask them to buy a pack of M&M plain chocolate, you know, the brown bag from the gas station or from any uh, uh, retail store. And the bag has candies and there are six colors in there. Orange, red, blue, yellow, uh, brown, and uh, what's the next color? I don't know. There are six colors in there and green, and green. So I asked the students to buy uh, this. I have, let's say 30 students, 30 students, uh, will purchase, you know, just a uh, plain chocolate M&M uh, pack. And then uh, I'll ask him to open it in the class and count the color of each one. Can you guess, guys, what is it that we do with it? It's just if you have a, a feeling of what would we do with those. And then I collect, you know, just uh, the color of... Uh, I go to each student and I ask him to write down, you know, just how many of each colors. Then I do the totals, you know, just from each color. Let's say uh, a typical, you know, just uh, pack has like about 50 to 60 pieces. So we collect about 1,700 uh, pieces of candy. And then we sort them out by color, how many of each color. Can you guys guess what do you think that we will be studying in here? What do you think why the reason of doing this? What is it that we want to study or test? If I, if I ask you to do this and I don't give you a hint what's coming next, what would you be thinking that what is it that we're trying to test? by asking students to buy the candies from all over the place, bring them to the classroom, sort them out by color, count how many of each color, and then to do what? Any ideas? Okay, let me tell you what we do. The company that makes the candies, it's Mars Chocolate. Uh, they state that they follow a certain percentage when they make the candies, they say like 14%, uh, uh, you know, just of their candies should be red, 14% should be green, probably 24% blue, etc. So they have a criteria. What we do, we test if the criteria still holds, if what the company says is true. So we do it, you know, just in the classroom. They, they say that they follow a certain percentages. But is it going to turn out, you know, that the percentages, you know, just are accurate in every single, you know, just pack of candy? No, this is not going to uh, happen. But that's why I ask, you know, just many students to purchase the candies and put them together. Then we can have a large sample to test. So this is the reason uh, why we do this assignment. And let me show you another example here. From our understanding, we think, you know, that people prepare their tax income using the following methods. 24% of us go to accountants, 20% of us do it by hand, 35% use a computer software, 6% ask a family or a friend to do the taxes for them, and 15% go to those tax preparation uh, services and if you add them up guys they will add up to 100 percent so this is our understanding that this is how people prepare their taxes the question is is this distribution is still valid in our time for example right now do still 24 percent of people go to an accountant do 20 percent you know go do it by hand do 35 percent use uh, do it by computer software 
in order to test this, guys, you need to survey people. So you collect a large sample of people and you ask them, how do you prepare your taxes? And they will tell you whether, and you ask them, is it an accountant by hand, computer software, friend, family, tax preparation service? You get, you know, just the information from people, you get how many go to accountant, how many go do it by hand, how many do it by computer software, how many use a friend and family and how many go to tax preparation service. And then you use this data to test, you know, whether this distribution right here is still valid. As you notice, there are more than 2%. You learned how to work with 2%, P1 and P2 in chapter eight, testing the difference between two proportions. But here, guys, I have more than two proportions. I have one, two, three, four, five proportions. In order to test whether a certain distribution still fits or it doesn't fit anymore, we use what we call a chi-square goodness of fit test. This goodness of fit test, guys, I'm gonna show you how to do it by hand and I'm gonna show you how to do it with the calculator. So when you have more than 2%, guys, and you are asked to do a hypothesis test, it's gonna be definitely what we call a goodness of fit test. Let me show you another example. Just one second. I'm going to another example. It's still about the accounting. It's too many pages to explain the process, but you see once I do it, it's gonna be a very uh, straightforward process. Okay, here you go. Uh, look at number nine guys, just to give you a feel of what we're doing. And once you learn how to do one question, you're gonna be able to do them all. A research firm claims that the distribution of the days of the week that people are most likely to order food for delivery is different from the distribution shown in the figure. So this is what we think, what percent of people order food on what day of the week. So food at your door. Like you notice 36% of people order food on Friday, at the beginning of the weekend, they're tired, they wanna have a break from cooking, they order food. Saturday goes to 24%, Sunday 7%, Monday 4%. Do you guys know why people don't order food on Monday? Is there, do you, do you have uh, a reason to uh, justify that? Any feedback here? Why do you think, you know, the Monday is the lowest? Just say what you think, guys. I'm not gonna uh, grade you for this. Because everybody's diet starts on Monday. Okay, so they, well, that's well, that's a good reason. Another reason they have a leftover from the weekend so they can eat it, you know, just on Monday. They treat themselves well, you know, just on the weekend. And look, on Tuesday, it picks up. Wednesday, 13% goes down to 10% on Thursday because people are looking forward to Friday probably, guys. Okay, this is what we think the distribution is. If somebody come to us and tell us, well, I don't think this distribution is valid anymore and we need to test it, here's how you test it. You select 500 people and you ask them which day of the week you order food for delivery and you get the results here. And then based on the results, guys, you can make a conclusion whether this distribution is still valid or not valid. And this is called a goodness of fit test. You're gonna learn how to do it, but I'm just giving you an insight. Okay, let's, let's show you another one. This you will like here if you drink coffee. 
Okay, here's another one. A researcher claims that the number of cups of coffee U.S. adults drink per day are distributed as shown in the figure. Okay, here's the figure, guys. How many cups of coffee do you drink per day? We surveyed Americans before and 36% say they don't drink any coffee. 26% they say they drink one cup. 19% two cups. 8% three cups and uh, four or more cups, 11%. If you guys are suspicious that this is not a valid, you know, just distribution anymore, and you need to find out whether it works, it still works or not, you have to survey people nowadays. So we survey 1,600 US adults and ask him how many cups of coffee do you drink per day? Here is a response. Zero cups, 570 say they drink zero cups. One cup, 432. Two cups, 282. Three cups, and you can use, guys, your results from the survey to make a conclusion whether this, this distribution is still a good one or it's not good anymore. And in order to do that, guys, we need to do what we call a goodness of fit uh, distribution. So what I'm gonna do uh, now, I'm gonna do an exercise with you guys to explain, show you the process and how to do this. And you just follow the process that I use when you do any exercise because it's gonna be redundant. The exact same work I do with one exercise, you do it with the rest. Look, this is another exercise, guys. How old are people who go to the movies? From previous studies, we think that 90% of people who go to the movies are 40 to 49 years old, 22% 29 are 25 to 39, 26% are over 50. How come this increase, guys, from 40 to 49, it was 9% and increased to 50 plus is 26%. I think I know the reason why. You guys know why? Can you tell when people get older, they tend to go to the movies uh, more often than people who are 40 to 49? Yes. Why, what is the reason? You're just more interested in going to the movies and going out in general. Uh, well, I am, but I don't have much time, you know, just to do that very often you know when you're 50 plus they're assuming that many of those are retired and if you're retired you don't have much to do you don't have work obligations other things i mean 40 to 49 is is a peak time you know for people to be working hard working overtime but 50 plus includes 60 plus includes 70 plus this is when people retire they want to enjoy life and you can see, look, teenagers, 2 to 17, 23%. So if you're suspicious that this doesn't work anymore, you need to collect data. So you survey people. Here they survey 1,000 people. And they ask them for their age as they walk into the movie theater. And these are the uh, called the observed values. And now, guys, I'm going to show you how to use those values against this one to decide whether this distribution is still a good distribution or not a good distribution uh, anymore. Okay, so now you have the idea, we're gonna take you to a problem. Okay, you have, uh, you have a three exercise, ages of movie gores, you have coffee, and then we have the pizza. You can tell me which one would you like us to do here? I'll, I'll go with the first student who suggest an exercise. Any, uh, any preferred uh, exercise? Because th the work is the same for all of them. Let's do the coffee one. Okay. It's uh, number eight. And this is the exercise. All right. So I'm just going to get the data ready and we're going to show you uh, how to do uh, this exercise. 
Okay. So uh, let's begin with age two to 17 is 30, 30%, 23%. I'll just write them down on a piece of paper because I will need them. 18 to 24 is 20%. If you have a scrap sheet of paper, guys, write them down because you can work with me on this. 25 to 39 is 22%. And 40 to 49 is 9%. And then 50 plus is 26%. And then from the survey, we had 240 who said that they were aged between 2 and 17. 209, 203, 106, and 242. All right. So here is the question. Oh, I'm doing the movie course anyway. We're doing seven. We'll do seven. A researcher claims that the ages of people who go to the movies at least once a month are distributed as shown in the figure. You randomly select 1,000 people who go to the movies at least once a month and record the age of each. The table shows the results. At alpha equals 10%, test the researcher claim. Okay, so alpha is 10%. All right, let's do this exercise. So I'm gonna switch, guys to my uh, document camera and show you how to do the work there. So let's do that. Okay. And please pay attention to this, guys. Once you grasp this one, you should be able to do it with any exercise. So these are the percents that we were given, and these are the observed values. And the sample size was 1,000. Okay. And we need to test that the distribution of the people who go to the movies is as claimed in here. So it's still valid that 23%, 20%, 22%, 9%, 26% still works. Here's how you start, guys. HO, you write always the distribution is as claimed. If you want to put above, that's fine. Any guess what do you think HA is going to be? If HO, the distribution is as claimed above, what do you think HA? HA, remember, it's a complement. The distribution is not as claimed. Exactly. Distribution of movie cores is not as claimed. All right. And he says, test whether the distribution is as claimed. So this is where our claim here. OK. Uh, we're going to use what we call a goodness of fit test. Let me write it down. And it's called a chi-squared goodness of fit test. It is built into your calculator as well, but you need to understand how to do this by hand first before we get into the calculator. So you learn guys about Z distribution, you learn about T distribution. Now we have this chi-square distribution. Let me show you the chi-square distribution. It looks like this. It's always a positive one. So, and it's skewed to the right. This is the chi-square distribution. Uh, 
So it's always positive. When you compute the test statistics, it will always be uh, positive. It is a scoot to the right distribution. The total area under the curve is always uh, uh, one. And this distribution changes with the sample size. Uh, as the sample size changes, you know, the shape, you know, just of this curve will change as well. So we will be using this chi distribution. It's called chi, chi square. Okay, so that is the distribution I'll be using to uh, solve this problem in section 10.1. So first of all, guys, you state the null hypothesis will always be the distribution is as claimed. The alternative hypothesis will always be the distribution is not as claimed. You don't change that, guys. So this is always, you know, going to be the case. So that's the step one. We did it. Step two, calculate the test statistic. And it's called chi-squared. I'm gonna show you the work, how to calculate that. And then later I'll show you how to use the calculator to find this uh, test statistic. These values, guys, that he gave us when we survey 1,000 people are called the observed values. So these are the observed values. So we have, we have categories. We have people who are age 2 to 17. And we have people who are aged uh, 18 to 24. Then 25 to 39. Then 40 to 49. And then 50 plus. And so this is the category here. These are the observed values. Let's write down the observed values. The observed values that we got from the survey, 240, were age 2 to 17, 209, 203, 106, 242. OK. Now I'm going to ask you guys a few uh, questions. So these are called observed values. Always the values that he gives you from the survey results are called the observed values. In order to find the test statistic, we need some values called expected values. And they're labeled as E. OK. If this distribution still works, guys, you would expect a 23% to be age 2 to 17. You would expect a 20% to be age 18 to 24. You would expect a 22% to be age 25 to 39, 9% to be age 40 to 49, and 26% to be over 50. And we have a total of 1,000. So do you guys have any idea how I can compute the expected values here? The observed values, you get them from the survey, but the expected values, you get them from the percents that you have. Remember, we survey 1,000 people who went to the movies. So how would I compute the expected values for the age 2 to 17? Would you take the 23% of 1,000? Exactly. And then you take the 20% of the total, the 22% of the total, the 9% of the total, the 26% of the total. Exactly. So look, it will be 0 0.23 times 1,000, which is 230. Then you do 0 0.20 times 1,000, which is 200, uh, 200. Then you do 22% times 1,000, which is 220. And these are the percents, guys. I'm not making them up. These are the ones given in the problem. Then you do. 0 0.09 times 1,000, 90. Then you do 0 0.26 times 1,000, which is 260. It's a lot of work, guys, to find the test statistics. So just bear with me now, and then you will see how this is done on the calculator. 
Are we multiplied by a thousand again? Because a thousand is the total number of people we surveyed. Oh. It's a number, it's a total, always the total. You just add them. If you add those up, you will get a thousand. So you always take the percent of the total, percent of the grand total, percent of the grand total, percent of the grand total until you get all of that. Okay, so this is O and this is E. Now guys, I like it to do O minus E for me. That should be an easy one. O minus E, just subtract O minus E. 240 minus 230, it will be 10. And why we're doing that, you will know in a second. Nine. Two or three minus 220, which is negative 17. Uh, 106 minus 90, which is 16. And finally, 242 minus 260, which is negative 18. Okay. So we just subtract. O minus E squared. Now I want to square the differences. It's a lot of work to compute the test statistic by hand. So what's 10 squared, guys? It would be 100. That's 81. Then we need uh, 17 squared. which is 289, 16 squared. Is it not negative 289? No, because negative times negative is positive. Oh, I see. Negative times negative is gonna be positive. So it's always positive, O minus E squared. So 256 here. And then, guys, you have 18 squared. So you can ignore, actually, the negative sign. will be 324. All right. And the last step. You're gonna appreciate the calculator a lot, guys, once we're done with this. Was most of the work here is done on the test statistic, but I will allow you to use the calculator where this will, all that work will be simplified later. Okay, can you guys help me find O minus E squared divided by E here? So what is O minus E squared here? A hundred divided by E, which is 230. What about this one now? 81 divided by E, which is 200. This one will be 289 divided by 220. This one will be 256 divided by 90. And this one will be 324 divided by 260. So that's the last column I need. And let me tell you why we did all of this, because the test statistic is given by this formula. I'll write it down and show it to you. The test statistic, guys, is the sum of all the values in the last column, which is we call it O minus E squared over E. Now, why did I have to go through all of this? Well, I need O minus E. Well, in order to find O minus E, guys, you need O and you need E. And that's why I did E. O will be always given to you. E will be a percent of the total, always. So we did O minus E. Now, why did I square each one? Because the formula has O minus E squared. So I had to square each one. So I square them. Now, why I did divide each one by E, by its E, because the formula says you need sum of O minus E squared over E. So your test statistic, guys, would be 100 
over 230 plus 81 over 200 plus 289 over 220 plus 256 over 90 plus 324 over 260. Okay, let's do this together and find the test statistic. Okay, I'm going to put them on the calculator 100 divided by 230 plus 81 divided by 200 plus 289 divided by 220 plus 256 divided by 90 plus 324 divided by 260. Okay, this is what I got, guys. It's a three decimal places, 6.244. All right, so this is all that work to do step two. We will see the formula on the calculator just in a few minutes after I complete this question. So let me repeat the steps. Step one, you state HO, the distribution is as claimed. HA, the distribution is not as claimed. Then in step uh, number two, you calculate the test statistic. Uh, when I wanted the students in the past to do this work by hand, guys, I used to provide them with the table, the skeleton, and put O, E, O minus E, O minus E square, O minus E square over E, and have them fill in the blanks here. And then once you're done, you just add up the output in the last column, and that's what he did, and that's the test statistic. Now we're going to make a decision whether to reject the null hypothesis or fail to reject the null hypothesis, and let me show you how we can do this. We're not using the calculator yet, so we're using traditional methods. So let me show you how to do that traditional method. And alpha was 0.10%. Okay. That is how you do it. So step three, you draw this distribution, screw it to the right a little bit, put chi square here, and that's a zero. Then you go to table six. You see what the table is called? Chi-square distribution. That's what we're doing. And you find a value that's called a critical value that splits up the rejection region from the non-rejection region. In order to find the critical value, you need alpha, which is 10%, but you need the degrees of freedom. And let me tell you what the degrees of freedom here is. number of categories minus one. Okay, and let me show you. How many categories do we have here, guys? One, two, three, four, five. If you subtract one, what do you get? Four. And alpha is 10%. Table six, watch. This is the 10% and this is the four and read it right here. I got 7.779. So you put 7.779 somewhere. Okay, because I told you the value will always turn out to be positive, the goodness of fit test in this section will always be a right tail test. So the rejection region will always be on the right. So you do this always. Whatever the value you come up with from the table, you shade to the right of it. Now my question to you guys, what was the test statistic? The test statistic guys was 6.244. 
where would 6.244 go? Will it go to the left of 7.779 or to the right of 7.779? Left. Left, because it's less than. Six point two four four. And what's your decision, guys? The six point two four four turns out not to be in the rejection region because the rejection region is always to the right. So then you fail to reject. H O. And then you conclude that there is not enough evidence at the 10% level of significance to reject the claim distribution. So probably still the same. It didn't change. And if you notice, guys, the differences between the observed and the expected wasn't too much. Observed were 240, we expect 230. It's not bad. So they're very close. That means this distribution that we already have in the problem here probably still valid. So there wasn't much difference between the observed and the expected value. If there is not much difference between the observed and expected value, you should expect that your distribution is still valid. Now, the question probably asked me, how can we do this using the calculator? So I'm going to show you. And if you have your calculator handy, guys, I'm going to show you how to do that using the p-value approach. Here we use the critical value approach. OK, using TI-84. First of all, you have to state HO and HA. You have no choice. Distribution is as claimed. And here distribution is not as claimed or has changed. In the book, sometimes they put has changed. And now the test is statistic chi-square. No work, guys. We're not going to do much work. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to go to the calculator, stat, edit. Okay. We're going to go to L1, highlight it. I'm going to clear it. And we're going to enter the observed values in L1. The observed values, guys, are the values given to you in the table. These are the observed values. So then right here. These are the observed values. We have to put them in L1. So I'm going to put in 240, 2.09, 2.03, 1.06, 2.42. What else do you think the calculator needs, guys, in order to find the test statistic for us? The percentages? Yeah. Not the percentages, the expected values. It needs them because the formula that uh, we use to find the test statistic needs O and E. So you need to provide the calculator with E's. So can you do this? And the E's, guys, you did them right here. The percentage, not just the percentages, guys. Be careful. The percentage times the total. Percentage times the total. Percentage times the total. So I have 230. I have 200. I'm just copy the word. So you still have to do a little bit work of by hand, but not much. There you go, and I'm done. So guys, if you're taking notes, observed values go to L1 and expected values go to L2. And now I'm ready to show you how to find the test statistic and the p-value. So you go to stat, tests, 
scroll up. Can you guys see the test? See. Not C. Go to D. What does it say? Do you see the G O F? Do you know, guys, what the G O F stands for? Goodness of fit test. I know, yeah, C it's tempting, but the D says chi square goodness of fit test. So take a note, guys, for section 10.1 is D. D, always D. So I'm gonna go to D. Oops. Enter. It says observe values in L1, expected values in L2. What were the degrees of freedom? Number of categories minus one. We have five categories, minus one will be four. So always the degrees of freedom of number of categories minus one. So we have four here. Make sure to put this. And let me hit calculate, guys. And we're ready to go. There you go. That's the statistic. Look at the match, guys. See my test statistic, the work I did by hand. And now the calculator does it for you. So. I'll write it down. So let me put some details here. Put observed values in L1. Put expected values in L2. Run chi square GOF test. Degrees of freedom is number of categories minus one. So chi square guys is 6.244 and look what else we need, the p-value. So you don't need to worry about the table here. Uh, 0.1817. Which is guys, you agree with me, it's more than alpha. Fail to reject HO. And then if you fail to reject HO, you say there is not. enough evidence at the 10% level of significance to reject the claimed distribution. So the distribution is still as is, it hasn't changed. This is how you do it using your uh, calculator. Any questions, guys? I have a question. Um, mm -hmm. The value you used to reject the claim, isn't it to support or is the- No, claim the claim happened to be in the null hypothesis here. Oh, so the I null? use okay. the word reject. That's a good question. Yeah, so that's why we use the word. We cannot reject the claim. When the claim is an anal hypothesis, we say either there is enough evidence to reject it or there is not enough evidence to reject it. Okay?